Welcome to the Biohacking Beauty Podcast. My guest today is Dr. or, well, Tom uh, Seeger, PhD. And uh, I'm very excited to have Tom on because Tom is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the authority in uh, cold ex- deliberate cold exposure. And before, before we kind of get into a, a conversation, uh, Tom, I'd really like for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about, about you. Thanks for uh, pointing out, I'm not a medical doctor. My yeah. degree is a doctor of philosophy. Mm-hmm. I'm an engineer actually. And I started uh, my faculty career at Clarkson University where I earned my PhD some 20 years ago. Now I'm at Arizona State and I got into studying resilience. At first it was infrastructure resilience. What happens when the hurricane comes? What happens in the earthquake? And because I'm a civil engineer, what do we do with our power systems and our highways? And it must have been four or five years ago, I realized that our infrastructure systems can only be as resilient as our people. Every disaster is a psychological challenge, not a challenge of concrete and steel. And so this got me going really deep into how do people respond to stress? Same time, I was having my own stress in my own life. My kids were growing up. They were graduating high school, graduating from college. And my wife and and I had separated. So I started reading everything about self-improvement. I'm like, well, you know, if I'm going to date, I really got to get myself back in shape. I got to talk about beauty podcasts. I'm going to (laughs) say, this is a surprise. You know, you're not supposed to have dog faced old guys like me on your beauty podcast, but Your customers will sort that out for themselves, I guess. (laughs) So I started reading everything. And one of the books was Mike Cernovich, Gorilla Mindset. He doesn't even talk about this book anymore. I don't know how he feels about the book. A lot of the time I'll write something and I'll put it out there in the world and I'll think, wow, this is the greatest thing. And then 10 years later, people are emailing me about it. And I'm like, I I don't even know where I put, I don't even have a copy of that anymore. Uh I don't even want to remember what I said because our our ideas change as we learn more and that's okay. But one of the things that Cernovich was writing about was taking cold showers. Now, back then it was kind of novel. Everybody talks about cold showers now, but I'm reading this book and I have a rule. When I get advice from people who are successful, in ways that I want success. I have to try the advice. I have to try it. I don't have to take it, but I have to try it. And that leaves me open to new ideas and I can stay curious. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna take a cold shower because I read about it in this book. And I'm in there, you know, screw you, son of a bitch. And because cold <laughs> showers make me angry. And the only way I can get through it is I'm cussing out this guy I've never met who wrote a good book, but there's something about my mindset that uh, that was how I got through the experience. And then uh, Jason, my former student, now my partner at Moraz Co. Forge, he asked me, have you ever heard of Wim Hof? Well, no, I've never heard of anything like this. You know, I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm working for the Army Corps. I'm working for the Navy. I'm trying to keep things, you know, running under design. What do I care about some crazy Dutch mailman, you know? Well, Jason says there's this breathing exercise that you do, it's relaxing, and then you get in an ice bath. And I'm going, well, these cold showers suck. Now, why? You know, if cold shower was not a good experience, why would you go further Mm -hmm. into the ice bath? It seems like that's counterintuitive. But remember, Amate, I have a rule. So Jason comes to me and he says, you should try it out. Now I got to try an ice bath. Totally different. The people who are starting with cold showers, um, many of them have, they talk about the psychological difficulty, they talk about the physical pain, many of them face the same obstacle that I encountered. And then many of them have the same experience when they go whole body, like up to their neck. It's, it's, there's shock, right? The first 15, Mm -hmm. 30 seconds are tough, but then there's a relaxation. We measure this in the brain. The brain waves come down into a meditative state. And even if their toes hurt or their fingers hurt, there's some things you can do. When I started, I tucked them under my armpits. I left my toes out of the water and I got this incredibly uh, different experience. It was, it built resilience in me. It meant that I could go into the challenging situation and I could take control of my mind, my thoughts and my body 
And I could come through that difficulty feeling stronger and more energized. So Jason and I were buying, you know, 220 pounds of ice every weekend because, wow. right? It, I live in Phoenix. And even though I started the, we'll call them cold showers in the wintertime, you know, when the water is like 50 something degrees in Phoenix, by the time right now it's May, the water is already up to the 80, like low 70s. And this summer, we're going to be filling up the forge with like 90 degree water because I, there's no cold shower for me. Uh huh. So we buy 220 pounds of ice, we fill it up in this stock tank, and 15 minutes later, we got three people through and it's all melted. So yeah. Jason and I said, we got to do something about this. At that time, there was no such thing as an ice bath company. There wasn't even a cold plunge company, but we're engineers. And we said, all right, you know, we're going to buy some stuff and we're going to figure it out. We're going to take apart some freezers, you know, refrigeration. It's a hundred year old technology. We got to figure that. I'm going to tell you, it cost me like $60,000 in credit card expenses, you know, buying stuff, breaking it, throwing it away, figuring out how to make it work in the desert. And then uh, we still have pictures of, we call it Forge One. What mm -hmm. an incredibly ugly piece of crap that old <laughs> jalopy is. Like it was the worst thing you can ever imagine, but it made ice. And so we had a party and we're like, hey, we're going to show everyone off our contraption. Um, and people really liked it. So we put one, we put a picture up on Etsy. This was how little we knew about anything back then. We put a picture up on Etsy and we're like, hey, people like this. A friend of ours, you know, bought one. Uh, we should see if anybody out there. And sure enough, some guy in San Francisco, uh, he's pretty open about it. I can tell you, Winston. Um, whom, if you're in biohacking on the West Coast, you probably know Winston Dibrahim. Uh, he said, you have no idea what it took for me to track you guys down, but I, I've been looking for a product like this for years, and I finally found that picture you put up on the Etsy. We were so embarrassed. We were like, oh my God, we still have that thing. We got to get that thing off of there. But we sold Winston a forge. He introduced us to some people. We're the only thing like it. And that's how Morozco Forge got started. So there's this torturous path through civil engineering to concern about health, to concern about resilience and especially psychological resilience. Most people, they know about cold showers, they know about ice baths, maybe they were athletes in high school or college and they're used to ice baths for recovery. We don't market like that at all. We don't, you, we don't say the ice bath is good for recovery. We say exercise is good for recovery from your ice bath, not the other way around. And we have discovered so much about deliberate cold exposure, mostly because I'm a library guy. I know how to read the journal articles. I'm a scientist. And so we experiment on ourselves. Most of the wonderful things we've learned have been by accident, and that's okay. But you have a happy accident. You go into the library and you try and figure out what just happened. And sure enough, all the mechanisms are there. It was really hard at first to get Jason's wife, Adrian, into mm -hmm. the forge because she's like, I grew up in Florida. I'm an Arizona girl. I hate being cold. It gets down to 75 degrees in Phoenix. I got to put on a cap. You know, there's this term called Phoenix wimp where and it's, I hear from people all the time, you know, oh, no, no, I get cold at 75. Well, heck, Clarkson University, I got three degrees from Clarkson. It's northern New York. It's north of Lake Placid. It's like the, the 101st Airborne trains at the same latitude in northern New York as Clarkson does because of all the freaking snow. And if it got up to 50 degrees before finals week, we were out there playing Frisbee, you know, in our shorts with no shirt. We were like, wow, this is great. It's all relative. How could these Phoenix wimps get cold at 70 something degrees? And I had to go to the library. Turns out they don't have any brown fat. It turns out that if you spend your whole life, as Adrian did, away from the cold and you tell yourself a story about how, oh, you can't tolerate the cold, you don't like the cold, the brown fat disappears from your body. And it's only been about 12 years that uh, medical scientists have even been able to de do detect 
Advances in PET imaging allowed us to detect brown fat. And we're like, wow, we thought people just lost it as adults. All babies have it. We thought it just goes away. No, it doesn't. Some good studies on um, like Finnish policemen, uh, Swedish garbage collectors, you know, people who work outside, fishermen in Alaska, they have plenty of brown fat because they're exposed to the cold. Adrian had none. So I go back into the library and I said, well, what does this brown fat do? Cold thermogenesis. The, you'd think the sole purpose of brown fat to read the literature was to burn glucose in your bloodstream, to burn the lipids that are stored in your white fat, to keep you warm in the cold. And it makes sense because Homo sapiens had to come through all these ice ages. Okay, great. But it does something else. It signals the thyroid. The thyroid controls metabolism and the thyroid stimulates the brown fat, but the brown fat modulates the thyroid. In human beings who've had thyroid ectomies for whatever reason, they discovered there's still a thyroid stimulating hormone in their bloodstream. And I go, what, how does that make any sense? What, you have no thyroid to stimulate, but your body's trying? Like, that's kind of weird. They measured the brown fat and they measure in each of these subjects, and then they measured the levels of thyroid stimulating hormone. And sure enough, the more brown fat, the more thyroid stimulating hormone, Adrian's thyroid was dysregulated because she had no brown fat. Her thyroid's all over the place. She suffered from Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. She was on something like 17 different prescriptions. When she got into the porch, she began to recruit the brown fat. It stabilized her thyroid. A couple of years ago, she got a clean blood work. Her doctor was like, where did your Hashimoto's go? You know, that's a lifetime chronic degenerative disease and you're totally resolved. And Adrian's like, I don't know. Now she says, you can ask me about where do my egg allergies go? You can ask me about all the autoimmune dysregulation that I had because she reintroduced cold exposure back into her life. She recruited brown fat. She stabilized her thyroid. A lot of these complex mechanisms in her body have resolved. That's resilience. Resilience is the eustress, the hormesis effect. When you intentionally, deliberately stress your body, you give your body a chance to respond to that stress in a way that makes you stronger and healthier. We're supposed to be doing it, not in an accidental way, but in a deliberate way. And this is why we picked up on Huberman. I don't know if he coined the term, it's in the literature, but human use, Huberman from Stanford, he uses the term deliberate cold exposure. And the key here is doing it deliberately with intention, with a mindfulness. And that way, you know, we have a meditation, Adrian has a whole protocol uh, that helps you get the most out of your stressful experience by reminding yourself how this is good for you. So I still do resilient infrastructure research. I still have these contracts with the Department of Defense to talk about how do we, uh, we got a good one on surprise. How do we handle the surprise? How do we train people to better operate in the context of surprise? And it's wonderful. Um, but more and more of my energy is going into what I call the missing pillar of sustainability, health. Yes, we got economy, we got society, we got environment. These things have always been important to me. But health is more than just access to allopathic medicine or to institutional health care. Health is about the quality of your life, and it requires this deliberate approach, especially in the industrial world in which we live, this deliberate approach to introducing the right stressors so that your body, which knows how to take care of itself, but your body has a chance to respond to those stress signals and up your overall level of well-being. Yeah, and, and that's very interesting that we we are kind of maybe taking a pause in, in this beautiful journey that you're taking us through, but uh, taking a pause in, in uh, making things deliberate because there is actually different neuro neurochemistry and that's probably why Huberman is very attracted to it. When you're doing something with the intention of exposing your yourself to hardship, rather than uh, getting exposed to hardship maybe randomly or against your will. It's a completely different modality. And the reason I specifically love deliberate cold exposure, uh, getting into one of your wonderful forge uh, ice baths, 
uh, is because to me, it was a journey of understanding that it too shall pass kind of, kind of journey, uh, getting through different stages of my mind kind of battling against it and kind of coming through the other end saying, oh, I can stay here as long as I want. And, and that is a very, actually a very condensed process. I feel kind of educating the brain or, you know, our psyche or our subconscious to whatever state I'm in right now, if I just withstand this state, if I just reconnect to something within myself, there, there is another stage coming within the span of a few minutes is magical. It is very, very, very difficult to, um, to experience. There is a, uh, one of the, um, one Pompey, which is one of the uh, most famous um, um, Roman leaders, he, um, he had a very interesting um, point where, where he was, um, you know, he was basically out of, out of luck, out of uh, favor. And, I can relate. <laughs> and, yeah. And um, he was pretty, pretty, uh, you know, pretty advanced uh, in age at the time. Uh, and he was basically saying, I don't know if I will uh, have enough life in me in order to, to basically stay in this world until my luck changes. And normally it is a process. We it is a very uncertain process. We kind of, we've kind of touched on uncertainty and military. And I can tell you from my military experience, that's one of the things that the military, military especially in like high level units is trying to instill in you. Um, being calm in face of uncertainty. And normally it's extremely difficult because what you need to do is to play mind games in order to become uncertain. It's part of it. And what is magical about deliberate cold exposure, especially ice bath, because when we're saying deliberate cold exposure, we can just go outside in the winter. But especially mm -hmm. something as extreme as an ice bath, 35, 34, 36 degrees, is that the, the brain is going to get uncertain, almost like never mind what. You're going to get that 15, 30, one minute of uncertainty, even if you know it's going to pass. And educating yourself that it's going to pass is is uh, magical as a as a life tool, which goes way beyond the instantaneous, uh, only physical health benefits. And I agree with you that this is a very unique and important way to uh, to to address um, you know the Morasco Forge and, and deliberate cold exposure. But if we your, yeah, go ahead. Your brain is in constant communication with the cells of your body. It's the way human beings exist in this world. It has to be that way. The cells of your body are also in constant communication with your brain. So when you first get into the forge, every cell in your body is saying to your brain, get us out of here. We're going to die. You know, they're, they're in a panic mode. And it can create in your brain anxiety. There's a difference between fear and anxiety. Fear is something that's happening in the present moment. And it's entirely appropriate to, to these conditions. It will help keep you alive. It will help sharpen your focus. Nothing wrong with fear. But we often confuse fear and anxiety. Anxiety exists only in the future. It's the final exam you haven't taken yet. You know, it's the thing oh my gosh, you teach your teenage girl how to drive the car and she gets your license and you hand her the keys. Nothing bad has happened. But I, in my case, I'm anxious about what happens when she go, well, in my case, you know, she hit a car in a parking lot. All right. <laughs> hey, is everybody okay? We're like, <laughs> I'm not worried about that. Anxiety is something that is made up in our imagination. It is fear that exists only in the future. So I read a good book, uh, Bruce Lipton, The Biology of Belief. He says the cells in our body have no choice but to respond to our thoughts because they're biochemically connected, electrically connected. They have to do what the, their biochemical and electrical environment tells them to do. You get into the fort, 
And every single cell in your body is trying to tell your brain to get you out of here, not because anything bad is happening or has happened, but because you are afraid. And I should say in the future, you're anxious about what might happen. And so Adrian developed this wonderful mantra. When we get in, we experience the gas reflex, we get a pop of adrenaline, we start all of these anxiety responses start. She says, this is what cold feels like. And that's what you say back to your toes. That's what you say back to your hands. That's what you say back to your skin. The brain is getting all these signals about how we're gonna die. And the brain says back to all the cells of your body, this is what cold feels like. This is not death. This is not, you know, uh, shame or criticism or any of the negative emotions that drive us wild. This is what cold feels like. And then when I use that mantra, all the cells in my body are like, oh, you know, maybe you could have told us that before. <laughs> and we're cold now. All right, we're going to do the cold thing. I mean, my yeah. cells have a sense of humor. Um, <laughs> it calms down. And now we can explore the sensation of cold in the present moment without the fear of the future that is anxiety. Oh, my toes hurt. Your toes hurt because the smooth muscle tissue, the non-skeletal muscles that control your circulation are contracting. They're contra it's a process called vasoconstriction. They're contracting to shut off the blood that goes to your toes so that your internal organs will stay warm. Now your brain has a story. Now that, that story is true. It's a physiological response, vasoconstriction, right? But your brain gets to say, oh, this is what vasoconstriction feels like in the cold. Well, gosh, that kind of hurts. You know, <laughs> We're, we can reflect on every sensation. And yeah. instead of saying, are my toes ever going to stop hurting? I'm anxious that I'm going to feel this pain in my toes forever. Uh, when we're coaching someone through, we might say, you know, lift your toes up out of the water. How do they feel now? Oh, they feel really good. Now you get to control. How much do you want your toes in? How much do you want? And when you know you're in control, all the anxiety goes away because you can make what you want. You can experience the sensations that you want to experience. So in our method, we discovered there was room uh, for what Adrian and I call a more feminine approach. Like Wim Hof has done a great job introducing people to the benefits of the cold, getting them in the cold, coaching them through the cold, but not, you know, breathe, motherfucker, is yeah. not going to be for everyone. So we say there can be no coercion, there can be no bullying, there's encouragement, and encouragement is kind of a, a social pressure, if you want to think about it that way, but you get in like royalty, because you're in charge of your experience. You come out like royalty. I, as your guy, am merely your subject. Perhaps, uh, you know, Sherpa is another word that sometimes people use in entrepreneurial circles. I am your servant when I'm guiding you through the cold. You are in charge of your experience, and I will not be bullying my master, you know? Now, when I get in, I do the same thing. I'm the king. How do I want to be observed by my subjects? Ah, I want them to see my grace. <laughs> so I tell myself this story that I'm being watched. And uh, children are really good for this. Uh, you know, I have parents, they bring their kids, and you would be amazed in a, a grown human being who in one situation would be dysregulated and shout, you put them in front of their kids and many of them are, they want uh -huh. to say, good example. So I think of myself that way about trying to set a good example for the fact is nobody's watching. You know, I'm out on my patio. I'm by myself 90% of the time, but there's something in psychology and it's called the socially evaluated cold presser test. The cold presser test is a standardized instrument in which you immerse one hand, just one hand in a bowl of ice water. And then the psychologist is observing, you know, heart rate, sweat glands, how long can you stay in there? And for most people, it's like 30, 45 seconds or something. And they're like, oh, this is terrible. So 
it is designed to measure the subject's response to stress. Then someone, I forget, you know, off the top of my mind, the socially evaluated cold presser test is when you do this in front of a crowd and it changes how people respond. So this woman at University of Buffalo and she did the socially evaluated cold presser test and she compared when you do it in the presence of your spouse, doing it in the presence of the family pet. And she's gonna measure your stress response, uh, heart rate, sweat glands, electro you know, conductivity of your fingertips and how long can you stay in there? And she said, I'm gonna make up a number. It's not wrong, but something like 60% of the subjects had a better, had a calmer stress response with their family dog or their pet than they did with their spouse. And you can follow up on these people later and say, how are their marriages doing? The divorce rates among those people who were more uh, at ease with their family pet than with their spouse, way higher than the people who found support from their, you know, you're doing great. You look good. How does it feel? I bet you that hurts. You know, can you imagine being with a supportive spouse and healing or hearing their voice, heal your anxiety? It's an incredible study about how the story we tell ourselves is more important than the experience we're actually having. So this is what cold feels like. I'm in this bath because it creates a, a hormetic stress response in me. This gives me energy and prepares me for my day. All of those kinds of stories that you tell yourself help you live longer because your cells have no choice but to listen to your brain. It's uh, First of all, it makes me feel very good because my significant other still, still uh, can, sh she still wants only me there going through the first, you know, phase of yep. maybe not looking the best that you're going to look, you know, you're getting through anxiety or fear. And uh, this, it's so annoying because she breaks all of our records afterwards. <laughs> like after like a minute and a half, she, she looks up and she's like, you know, she was uh, on the verge of, of tearing up be like 30 seconds beforehand. Yep. And then she looks up and she's like, you can, you can let everyone in. Everyone goes in and then she stays, you know, way longer than anyone else could. And she's like looking, she's laughing and she says, oh, I can stay here forever. And I'm cursing in the corner, you know, because obviously she's sweeping <laughs> my, look my easy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she's sweeping my timing under the carpet, you know, easily. So that's, I see that's, a bright future for you too, Amate. Yeah, exactly. You're able to let go of this competitive nature, and I know no. you know it's part <laughs> of who you are. But if you can let go of it in this context, I see a bright future for you too. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, but you know, that's you did. You did kind of ask. You know, you did voice out loud when we started. Oh, why would why would this podcast uh, invite a a a person that's not not engaged in beauty? On a regular basis and you know what we're trying to do in this podcast and, and i think people have already figured it out from from what you were talking about is skin health skin is an organ obviously it's it's a very large organ when we're talking about cold exposure it's definitely a communicative organ but it is an organ that is reliant on our general health in order to function well and functioning well means looking good eventually and looking younger. Not only that, another facet of, of skin being an organ is our skin, our, the resources that are required to keep our skin healthy and uh, young looking are intertwined with the resources that are being depleted when we're living under stress whether it is uh, toxin removal through lymphatic drainage, whether it is very, very, very important blood circulation, whether it is stem cells that are being depleted due to elevated cortisol levels, which are like our stress hormone. And obviously the example that I give on a regular basis is looking at US presidents after eight years or four years of them being presidents and the extreme change that they've that they're 
going through physically. And that's Jimmy very- Carter was the greatest example. Who? Uh, I mean, I was 10 when he was elected, you know, and he gets into office and he's energetic and he uh -huh. looks beautiful. And he was the antithesis in many people's mind of Nixon who harbored hang dog and I've been run down by, yeah. you know, decades of public office. Man, four years later. Exactly. Guy, so he's looked 90 years old since 1981. <laughs> <laughs> so I think everyone intuitively should and can understand why adopting practices that are the opposite of that, that are teach teaching us how to lead, live or lead a life of conscious calmness and, and connection to the present is probably the most important tenant in our skin health regimen, even though it's not something that we necessarily do to our facial skin, because we can talk about, you know, deliberate cold exposure of our face. There are things in, um, you know, in more fringe aesthetic practices that are called like cryofacials. Uh, so we, the, our, our skin can enjoy deliberate cold exposure directly, but the real, the real important thing is the psychological uh, and the ongoing benefits of, of the resilience aspect of it. But it's not only that, right? So we are talking also about physical, um, physical benefits that happen when we, when we do go, undergo deliberate cold exposure. Uh, so what are, what are some of those, um, what are some of those benefits we get? Well, to be clear, you don't need, you know, 35 degree Morosco forge to get the metabolic benefits, to get the physiological stimulus. It's anywhere down in like the low fifties, you get below 60 degrees. And for most people, this is going to activate their metabolism. So what happens when you get a little bit of cold exposure in your life? When you begin to shiver, you know you have stimulated cold thermogenesis. And there's two types. There's the shivering, which your muscles do, and there's the non-shivering, and that's your brown fat. Most people have experience with shivering. They know what that's like because they have so little brown fat that they, their body doesn't have the capability to do non-shivering cold thermogenesis. Okay, when you shiver, your muscles are twitching, they're trembling, and they're burning glucose. And they're doing that just to generate heat. But when you've recruited enough brown fat for non-shivering thermogenesis to keep you warm, and again, 50 degrees is usually enough for some people to go, oh, it feels chilly. They'll get a little goosebump kind of thing, maybe a little vasoconstriction going on. And if they stay there for long enough, they will begin to shiver. That stimulates the recruitment of brown fat. Brown fat have, they're packed with mitochondria. So, that, I mean, we all know mitochondria, the powerhouse of the body. It's what, you know, it's the battery that makes everything go. But brown fat, the only job of brown fat is to burn energy to produce heat, at least metabolically. Signals the thyroid, there's other hormonal interactions. But metabolically, that's what it's doing. You recruit the new brown fat, you're packed with mitochondria, you don't shiver as much. So what happens? It clears glucose from your body like that. We've got really good data on the continuous glucose monitoring, in particular, type 2 diabetics, people who are not in good control of their blood sugar because they've developed something called insulin resistance. And why do you become insulin resistant? It took me a long time to figure this one out. The mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, they take glucose, they take chemical energy, glucose, fats, ketones, whatever you're going to burn, and they convert it to electricity. And in that process, they have to do it via chemical reactions. They produce what are called reactive oxygen species. Think of it as the sparks that are, you know, blowing off the Miami you have a light rail system and but New York is most famous for this, you know, they're drawing the electricity and there are stray sparks going on. These are the reactive oxygen species. When the carbohydrate levels are too high, the cell shuts down. It becomes resistant to moving the glucose 
across the cell membrane. It keeps the glucose in the bloodstream and glucose does a lot of damage in the bloodstream, but why? Because when it enters the cell, it will enter the mitochondria. The mitochondria have no choice but to start burning it up. And when the carbohydrate concentration is too high, the sparks destroy the, it, it can only work at a safe pace. You draw too much power and it begins to destroy the mitochondria. Mitochondria are the key to aging. Healthy mitochondria is a healthy metabolism. And so insulin resistance, type two diabetes, is your body protecting itself from your own crappy diet. Think about how clever your body is. You know, thank you body, because I really wanna eat that birthday cake with the brownies and the cookies that somebody brought in for the faculty meeting. They're trying to kill me, but it's so delicious. And your body says, great, we're gonna keep that glucose in your bloodstream so that you pee it out. We're gonna store that energy in your white fat cells until you come to your senses because the glaucoma and the capillary destruction is gonna eventually kill you, but not as fast as if we let that glucose into the cell where it can destroy the mitochondria. So what do we do with these type two diabetics who really should be fasting and go low carb so they can reverse their insulin resistance? What do we do with them? We give them insulin. We say, I'm gonna override that body's protective response. I'm gonna pack your bloodstream full of more insulin, shove that glucose into your cells so I can get the, the glucose, the blood sugar concentration in your bloodstream down at the expense of your mitochondria. So here's what I say, give me 10 days. I can reverse your type two diabetes. You don't have to exercise. You don't have to change your crappy diet. And I, I don't mean to be shaming my customers. I would love for them to give up the sugar in their diet. But when they get into the forge, they will recruit brown fat. They will stabilize their metabolism. They will clear glucose from their bloodstream. I have the data that demonstrates this is just the way our body works. They will improve their insulin sensitivity. Less than two weeks, their type two diabetes can be, I mean, depending on where they are, the most part result. No changes in diet no changes in exercise. And I'm still saying, yeah, you should go for a walk after your ice bath. You should use exercise to recover from your cold exposure. But the fastest way to fix your metabolism, get yourself back into that cold water. So there's one of the physiological benefits and it's the most important one is this metabolic correction that you get. Now, if you go on Twitter or Instagram, you're going to see a bunch of posts, you know, the 15 benefits of cold exposure. Number 12 will amaze you, you know, this, and we're guilty of this too. We have some of those tweets and things out there. And um, I've decided we're not going to do that anymore uh, mm -hmm. because the science on exercise recovery, it's no longer confusing. It's no longer complex. If you're working out and you get into the cold, to recover from your workout, you are going to retard or um, you're going to change your body's hormetic response. You, you have a tough workout, you've stressed your muscles, you know you're going to be sore, your muscles are going to be inflamed. All of that is your body's normal response, flooding your muscles with fluids that are going to help them rebuild. And if you get into an ice bath because you want to prevent that soreness right after your workout, you can put yourself into performance mode faster. We know this. You can come back and get back out on the field or back in the weight room or whatever it is you do. So if you're competing, use the ice bath because, I don't know, you're doing the Tour de France. I can't imagine me doing the Tour de France, but some people do this. And, yeah. of course, your knees hurt. So you're going to get into the ice bath and get you back into competition faster. Or Tiger Woods saying that in order to, you know, to compete, he has to do ice baths daily, et cetera. You got it. If you're training, if what you want is that anabolic response for your muscles, if what you want is you're not in performance mode, you're in training mode, then you got to wait hours before you use the ice bath. You wait hours to let your body do what it's programmed to do. Experience the soreness. Allow yourself the time to recover. An ice bath after exercise is only good if you got to turn around fast and perform again wait 
hours if you're using it for this sort of exercise recovery to, to allow your body to do the thing that you're training it to do. So we've stopped tweeting about ice baths for exercise recovery. Too many people are confused. They feel great. And they think if they feel great and it takes away the soreness, it must be better. Only if you got to run another marathon the next day. Okay. The other one, this is a huge myth and I haven't put this on any podcast yet. Ice baths will help you lose weight. And here's where the myth comes from. Partly it's my fault because I lost a lot of weight. Again, you know, I'm, I got to start dating again. I got to figure out apps, Amate. You know, I'm going to get like profiles and stuff and I want to look good. Now, little me, I didn't know how filters work. I didn't know how to Photoshop all that stuff. So I'm thinking, I just got to drop 50 pounds. I used to weigh 249. And when, you know, that's no way to date. So I lost a lot of weight and I thought ice baths helped. And I'm going to tell you how they helped in a second. But the first thing I'm going to say is ice baths are alone are not a reliable way to lose weight. But here's where the myth comes from. When you get in the ice bath, you clear the glucose out of your bloodstream and you begin to, you produce ketones right away and you begin to burn fat. We know this. You lift your metabolic rate and it stays elevated for hours. Well, isn't this a wonderful thing? The increased energy expenditure that happens in the ice bath, in theory, would it is burning fat, it would help you trim down, it would change your body composition. So if you believe in the calories in, calories out hypothesis, the ice bath will help with the calories out and you should lose weight. If that's the case, then why isn't Jimmy Moore losing weight? Mm -hmm. then why isn't Tom Seeger losing weight? Then, I mean, we both, Jimmy and I have both experienced a dramatic weight loss as a result of changing our diet, improving our exercise. But Jimmy has been doing ice baths every day, five minutes a day, 33 degrees. And he's every day in January, in, since January 1, 2022. And Jimmy's not losing weight. If ice baths were effective for losing weight, wouldn't we see the pounds coming off? And I'm back up to 215 right now. Some of it is a little more muscle, but I know from my waist, I know from my, you know, my body composition isn't where I was 20 pounds ago. Ice baths alone don't help you lose weight, at least not directly. I'll talk about indirectly in a second. And here's why. I found a study last week. There are complex compensatory mechanisms. Ice baths will help you sleep. I bought an aura ring and you know, I put it on, I wear it and it tells you about how you say, it says, Professor Seeger, you're sleeping great. Thank you, next day. You're still sleeping great, it's fine. You're still sleeping great. I'm like, why do I even have this thing on for? I'm getting plenty of sleep, especially when I'm in ketosis, I'm sleeping great. I go and I see, you know, Patrick and Michael Porter at BrainTap and they put me in the thing and they do the heart rate variability and they like, I'm 55. And I saw him at a conference. He was at Paleo FX, he yeah. came to Phoenix. He ran me through the thing. He said, congratulations, Tom, you're 30 years old, biologically. You know, there's a difference between my body composition, which is a little chunky, and my overall metabolic health. My metabolic health is great, but ice baths alone will not help me lose weight. They will help with a lot of other things. Mitochondria, anti-aging, uh, clarity of mind. They're great for the brain, but losing weight, no. Why not? Because the complex compensatory mechanism, all that extra energy that I burnt during the day, my body throttles down at night. It helps me sleep. It reduces my basal uh, metabolism rate. It reduces my body temperature. And these are parts of the reasons why I sleep better because I'm approximate. I'm signaling my body. Hey, winter's coming. We're going to hibernate. We're going to get into that deep restful state. And those calories that I thought I was burning up because the study said they measured and said, you're burning additional calories, but they didn't measure me at night. Yeah. So I saw this paper last week and it was rats. We got to be careful about rats, but you know, it's a place that we can do things to rats that you'd never be allowed to do to human beings. And sure enough, these rats that they forced to lose 20% of their body mass, then they let them eat however they want. They expose some of them to cold. Sure enough in the cold, this acute cold exposure, metabolism goes through the roof, energy expenditure goes through, but when they slept, all of the additional energy came back 
from reduced basal metabolism at night. And I'm going, I got to call Jimmy. You know, I, I got to get this word out there. We are no longer going to, you know, tweet or write articles about how ice baths, one of the benefits is weight loss, because that is a myth. And there's reasons for it. I shouldn't call it a myth. It is a popular misconception. And there's mm -hmm. some data that justified the hypothesis, but it's not consistent with our experience. Other things will help you lose weight and you should do them. If you're, I'm gonna tell you, you look great. I saw your Instagram videos with you in the ice bath. You're doing fine. But when you see me, you know, like, hey, that guy's a health guy. Like, I don't know, he's no Instagram model. I'm gonna pop over and see what Saladino is doing. That guy's got abs, you know? I'm, I'm not that kind of model. Um, it's not my job to look good on Instagram. It's my job to look smart, you know, cause I'm a college uh -huh. professor. But there's indirectly this way that ice baths help. I had a scare. Um, Okay, so like a lot of men in their early 50s, you're supposed to get, you know, I don't know, colonoscopies and all the stuff that allopathic medicine wants you to get tested for. Mm -hmm. But I read a book by Welch. He's a medical doctor. It's called Overdiagnosed. It came out before COVID. He said, these are the risks of getting tested for stuff. And I've been resistant to all these screening tests, but I'm getting my blood work done. I'm going to get everything. The whole male health panel, the STDs, the cholesterol, lipid, like I'm, you know, starting this journey. And I'm like, I got to get a baseline for everything. And it comes back and there's a big red exclamation mark next to my prostate specific antigen. Well, what the hell is that? And I got no idea. I got to Google this stuff. Prostate specific antigen is a blood marker that is correlated with prostate cancer. Now I'm 50 something years old and I'm reading about prostate. Oh my, am I having difficulty urinating? Like, I, I don't know what to do. And all of a sudden talk about anxiety. I'm getting paranoid. I had one prostate exam. It was 10 years ago. My doctor said, well, you're slightly enlarged. Probably not. I'm like, she's now in my head. I've got cancer because one test came back and it was twice, you know, it was double what they would consider normal. And I'm reading all this stuff and I'm like, well, you know, it's not a reliable test. You should go for an exam and have a biopsy. I'm like, well, I don't want to have an exam and I don't want to have a biopsy. So what am I going to do instead? I started talking to my friends. I have a lot of friends, you know, in the universities, faculty friends who are older than me. Some are younger than me. Um, turns out men don't talk about this stuff. You know, uh -huh. what am I supposed to do? Call you up someday and say, I'm going to tell you, how's your pee? Like, you know... <laughs> Are you really flowing or because I've been worried about my pro we don't we're never going to have this conversation women talk about this stuff all the time, at least I hear you know, but men are not going to do this. So it was awkward bringing it up but I talked to my friends I said, you know I got a PSA test I have my some blood work done and my PSA was hot and they go uh huh. And then i'm like wait a second has your PSA ever been high and they go uh huh. I go well, <laughs> what did you do I had to have a prostate exam and then they scheduled me for a biopsy. What was that like? And every guy I talked to, it was terrible. Well, what did you do after that? Well, you know, my doc doctor put me on some blockers for this or that and the other thing we're gonna keep an eye on it, blah, blah, blah. And one guy goes, I have my prostate out. Well, what was that like? And the nightmare, I mean, for me, it was a nightmare for he's living it. And I don't wanna judge him because the what he's chosen for himself is right for him. And I wanna learn from his experience and I decided I would never choose it for me. But many, there's more than one man that I talked to said, um, no, I'm not happy. I mean, I'm happy that I don't have cancer, but all of these other effects, whether it's erectile dysfunction or whether it's difficulty controlling urination, all these other things, I feel humiliated and I feel self-conscious talking about it. It's not the way I was imagining living my life at this age. I thought, I don't want any of that. But they all reported that their wives, their families, their loved ones put a lot of pressure on them to do to go to the doctor, get screening. Don't try and be a hero. You know, if the doctor says, get your prostate out, then that's what you've got to do. These people who love these men, they felt like they were doing it for the ones 
that they wanted to continue to provide for the ones who cared about them and that they were not alone in this journey and they would be letting their children or their wives down if they didn't do this thing. So I'm gonna tell you, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell, I mean, I talked with these men about it, but I didn't tell the women in my life. I didn't tell my daughter. I didn't tell my family because I didn't want them to put all that pressure yeah. on me. I said, I've got to find another way. So I did keto. I did cold exposure. I'm like, something in my intuition was saying, I'm going to double down on what I think is healthy. Now, later, I read about the Warburg effect. I read Travis Christopherson's book, um, Tripping Over the Truth. I read about the war on cancer and what a ridiculous bull crap, you know, billion dollar debacle. Nixon signed this bill and it's the war on cancer. And it's been, you know, I was a child. What has it been 50 years? And we have barely moved any measure on cancer. There's some things we can do. Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay. We got a good handle on very few. So I started reading about this stuff, but my intuition at the time was telling me more ice baths, more in and out of ketosis. I brought my PSA down from over seven to under one. No okay. surgery, no exam. And I'm, I know it's not reliable and every once in a while I'll still get it checked, but something else happened. Of course, I'm going for the male health lipid panel and a different red exclamation mark came back. And this one was my testosterone through the roof, 1140. It turns out, you know, I'm a 52 year old man and I'm walking around with the testosterone of an oversexed 19 year old kid. Now, my girlfriend was on somebody else's podcast and they asked her about this and she goes, well, I can tell you it's been a little bit of a problem. You know, she made a <laughs> joke uh, about it, which was she's got a great sense of humor. Um, and I'm back out on the dating scene, like I'm having these new experiences and I don't really know what that's like, but I've gotten, I've dropped a lot of weight and my testosterone's through the roof. I went to see my urologist. He goes, uh-huh. Well, I tell you what, why don't you just get this one other thing checked? Now, my urologist is about the same age as me, a little older, and we're both, you know, highly educated. And he watches me through this journey and he's like, Seeger's juicy. You know, I don't know if he's got uh -huh. cream or something or what he's taking, but he's never seen results like this. Now, come to find out later, this is pretty freaking normal. I am not like some incredible testosterone exception. It's just that in our standard American, you know, Western world, it's very unusual for 50 year old men who lead basically sedentary lives in the library or the laboratory to maintain these levels of testosterone that they had when they were teenagers. He gets me checked for luteinizing hormone. It's a metabolic precursor to testosterone. I had to look this up. If you're juicing, you can have high testosterone, low luteinizing hormone. But if it's all endogenous, high luteinizing hormone, high testosterone, I go get more blood drawn. It comes back. There's a red frickling exclamation mark. And you know what that means, Amate. My luteinizing hormone is through the roof. How did this happen? I got to go back to the library. Like this... Either I'm going to, the hell with this ice bath business, I'm going to go do, you know, sell fake pills to boost your testosterone. I hear that's a great business, or yeah. I've got to figure this out. Sure enough, in Japan, this is the early 90s, found a study that they did on college age men, like so early 20s. And they're like, well, we want to measure what happens hormonally when people do exercise and then they do an ice bath to recover from the exercise. It's a classic question. And they saw the testosterone was suppressed. So this is another reason not to ice bath immediately after exercise, because the ice bath took the testosterone levels way down. And I don't know why these Japanese scientists did it, but in like 1991, they said, well, what the hell, we'll try it the other way around. First, you're going to ice bath, and then you're going to get on the exercise bike, and you're going to rewarm. Sure enough, they got in the ice bath, T levels went boom, but they went on the exercise bike after and they went way the heck up. Luteinizing hormone, way the heck up. T levels, way the heck up. Higher than before they got in the ice bath. And I go, this is exactly what I've been doing. I was scared out of my, out of my mind about my prostate. I'm getting into the ice bath. I come out and it's cold as hell. I'm like, okay, I gotta do something. Leo Savage showed me how to use a steel mace. You know, I did like yeah. a two day course with him to get certified 
in this like Persian martial art kind of thing, but he just wants to teach me how to dance, which I don't mind, but it was, so I get out of the ice bath and I pick up my mace and I'm doing the stuff that Leo tells me to do because I'm cold and I'm rewarming with exercise. And I go, Amate, I've been doing this Japanese protocol of using exercise to recover from the ice bath and my testosterone and luteinizing hormone go through the roof exactly the way their research says. So I had to whole, write a whole article on it. And Jason goes, ah, it's bullshit. Okay, he didn't actually say that, but I know he's thinking it because I know him pretty well. He goes, it's not your ice bath exercise regimen. Look, you're out on the dating game again. You lost some weight. You're feeling good about yourself. You've got these ladies that are, you know, texting you and stuff. That's what your testosterone is. Okay, Jason's got kids. Jason's married. All of these things have been in, you know, epidemiological has shown to depressed testosterone. So Jason goes, I'll show you, I'll get my testosterone checked. He's been doing this on his birthday for two years in a row. His last test, you know, October birthday, 990. Wow. That is again, that like, no, there's some seasonality. It's higher during the summer and Jason's testing during the fall, but are you kidding me? 990? Jason's in his early forties. It is that he's supposed to be falling off a cliff. Yeah. has gone up every year. There's now that we have the experience and we have the science, I, this is the kind of advice that guys my age should try. I'm not take, telling them to take it. I'm saying, get your T-level checked, start the ice bath, do the exercise. Three months later, get it checked again, see if anything happens for you. And what does testosterone do? Ice baths will not help you lose weight through some calorie in, calorie out hypothesis. But testosterone signals your body to change your body composition. It will tell your body to take the calories that you're eating and channel more of them into building muscle and less of them into building fat, which is really what we want. It's not what the scale says. It's what is the body composition? So Correct. ice baths can help if you use them properly. If you use them as a precursor to your workout, if you use exercise to recover from your cold exposure instead of the other way around, then you could lose some weight. Then you could gain some muscle. Then it will help with your body composition. Yeah, and, and that's a very good point because, you know, kind of to, to obviously we're going to have Adrian on the podcast and we're really going to get into um, different methods of us kind of exposing ourselves and, and obviously getting through the more hands-on or, or yeah, to get, to get more how to's, but I did want to kind of maybe wrap up our discussion in what is a, a, a healthy or what is the uh, amount that we should be exposing ourselves to the cold, uh, you know, time-wise and, and times per week, how does it look like? There's a researcher in Denmark, Huberman cites her all the time, Susanna Suber. I don't know, I can't, they, if you want to learn Danish, you got to stick a potato in your mouth, you know, uh -huh. and then all of the consonants are going to come out better. So in English, you would say Soberg, uh, uh -huh. but in Danish, it's a little bit different and I'm going to mutilate it, but Suber or something like on this effect. She's on Instagram. She looks great. She does these cold water immersion videos in her bathing suit, and that attracts a lot of people to the science. And she published a paper in Cell, and she did these exhaustive um, descriptions of brown fat in cold water swimmers. And here's what she came up with, 11, 11 minutes a week. Now, it, she doesn't have a forge, but she has a fjord. You know, she can go into the channel, into the ocean, and it's wicked freaking cold in Denmark in the winter. So she's getting good, like four degrees C, three degrees C, uh, good cold exposure down at the kind of temperatures that are typical of a forge. She says 11 minutes, 11 minutes a week. And it doesn't matter how you divide it up. Do one minute, then do four, then do two, just get 11 minutes a week. You will recruit brown fat. You will get the metabolic benefits. So I am I'm going to cite her work as 
Divide it up any way you want. Do the 11 minutes all at once if that's what you got to do. But get your 11 minutes a week, and that will maintain the brown fat and the metabolic benefits. But there's something else that goes, it's outside the scope of her study, and it goes back to the psychology. My girlfriend has a daughter. Um, she has cerebral palsy, which is CP for short. And part of that is a spinal defect. She doesn't have the sensation in her feet that you and I have. So the daughter was almost 10 years old and she sees me, you know, out of my forge and kids are like this. They're like, oh, can I do it? You know, as if that was gonna be fun or something, but kids always wanna try stuff that grownups they admire are doing. And her mother, my girlfriend is kind of like, oh boy, you know, I, I wanna be very careful with my child. She's got cerebral palsy. She's got this spinal cord, like sensitivity thing. Um, but mom doesn't wanna discourage her kid from trying things either because you know, when she was little, the doctors had her in braces and they said, well, you better buy a one story home. Your child's never going to be able to do stairs. And yeah, she'll be lucky if she learns to walk. And if my girlfriend had raised her daughter with that kind of mentality, then the, the girl would never learn to walk. She doesn't want the daughter to think of herself as limited. Yeah. So the daughter says, can I get in? And my girlfriend is like, well, you could, you know, you could maybe you could put your feet in. And that's it. So she does. Her daughter says, mom, this feels really good on my feet. Can I go in up to my waist? And my girlfriend who suffers from Renault, like she is not good in the cold. Yes, of course, honey, you can go in up to your waist. And she goes, mom, I like this. Now she's 10. She's feeling sensations in her lower body that you and I take for granted. But she is now for the first time in touch, like through her nervous system with what is going on in her lower body in a way that she hasn't experienced before. She says, mom, can I go up to my armpits? And my girlfriend can't even watch at this point because she's afraid. She's empathizing with her daughter and she knows what kind of response she would have in the cold from her nods. Daughter goes in up to the armpits. She's smiling. She's talking. She's having a wonderful experience. That is what motivated my girlfriend to get into the ice bath. Because when her daughter came out and talked about how wonderful it was, my girlfriend said, well, I've got to set a good example. I've got to give this a try. We got a video. Adrian coached her through it. She talks about her Renauds. Turns out you go back to the library and for a particular kind of Renaud's, I forget whether it's primary or secondary, sure enough, deliberate cold exposure, it's a stress inoculation response. Sure enough, deliberate cold exposure is how you resolve your Renaud's. And I'm like, oh, it makes sense. Vasoconstriction, vasodilation, brown fat, right? So now she's got no problem. Now, uh, my daughter's girlfriend is 12. And this is what I mean about Susanna Sober says, get your 11 minutes. This 12 year old with CP, did 30 minutes in the ice bath wow. because it was something psychologically going on. She knows that Joe Rogan has a forge. She knows that Joe Rogan did like a minute and a half, called himself a wimp, jumped out of the forge, got into his sauna and got a call from Jocko Willink. And Jocko says, a minute and a half, my son can do 20 minutes. You should be ashamed. I don't know if Jocko really talks like this. I've never met Jocko, right? But Joe posted the next day and Joe's like, well, Jocko will call me up and he made me feel like a wimp. So I got to go back in the ice bath and I'm going to do 20 minutes, damn it, because that's what Jocko says I should be able to do. It's the most boring 20 minutes of Joe Rogan you're ever going to see in your life because the guy is funny and he's smart and he's hilarious, but this is 20 minutes of Joe Rogan, you know, doing this and that's it. He was after something, he had a goal and he wanted to achieve it. And that is not metabolic. And it's got nothing to do with, you know, brown fat. And he's like, Jocko dared me to do it. And I'm gonna freaking do it. Cause that's the kind of guy I am. You know, good for you, Joe. It started this whole internet sensation last summer. Somebody made a Joe Rogan ice bath action uh -huh. figure and put it up on Twitter and, you know, tagged. It was freaking hilarious. We'll probably retweet it next week. And my girlfriend's daughter knows that Joe Rogan did 20 minutes. So she's like, I'm going to beat him. 
Wow. Oh, what, what do you say? She gets in there and she's like, how long has it been? And my girlfriend's really worried. She's texting me. I'm in the next room. And she's like, Tom, it's 12 minutes. Is she okay? Tell me she's okay. I'm like, look, hypothermia, it'll take an hour. And she's young. You know, we can always take her to the hospital if it's really, I'm, and I'm kind of, I'm poking my God. I probably shouldn't do this on the tape. Um, she goes, it's been 20 minutes. She's beaten Joe Rogan. Can't she come out? She says she doesn't want to come out. I say, I've done the, we have this great article on the dangers of ice baths. And hypothermia is like the, you don't have to worry about it. Even though Kelly McGonigal slipped it into like a TED talk or a book or something, she goes, yeah. oh, two minutes, you're going to die. No, that's not true. You got like an hour before your core temperature is going to drop more than like a degree and a half Fahrenheit or maybe it's Celsius, but I'm not concerned about that. She, my girlfriend's daughter gets up to 30 minutes and now my girlfriend is begging me to tell her to get out. And I'm starting to worry myself, like, wait a second. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't know anything about cerebral palsy. Like, what am I doing? I'm like, okay, you get, get out of the ice bath. Now, there's something about the way her nervous system is constructed that is different than you and me. She doesn't feel the cold. She doesn't get the same warning signs from her toes and from her skin. She experiences sensations that she doesn't want to give up. When she came out, her legs didn't really work. Um, you know, I mean, she was walking and we gave her some things to do to help her rewarm. It took forever. But I said, all right, get her in the car. We live in Phoenix. I want you to do a car sauna. Turn the heat up as high as you can stand it. And for my girlfriend with her daughter, that's mm -hmm. like all the way. Drive around in the car with the heat on because I've done the measurements. You're going to get up to like 175 degrees Fahrenheit. You wow. My girlfriend will be sweating like crazy. We call it car sauna here, but it will help. The dry heat is the way to rewarm, not wet heat, dry heat, because wet heat can also cause vasoconstriction and you want vasodilation after you've been through the ice bath. So we rewarmed the girl and I've been thinking there's something more than 11 minutes a week. When you are working on the nervous system, your psychology, when there's something you need to do to feel right about yourself, then do it. Do it with the support of your mother or your friends or more experienced people. The psychological element is why I need ice in the forge. Because when I stare at that ice, it scares the crap out of me. And this still happens. I've been at this for years. I've invented the freaking machine. You know, Adrian invented the method and me and Jason and Adrian have been doing this all the time. And I stare down at that ice and I'm like, Heck, it's, <laughs> you know, it's terrible. I need the ice. I need the 34 degrees because if I'm not anxious, I don't feel the same sense of accomplishment. Sometimes I remember like my girlfriend's daughter and I'm like, Tom, you're such a wimp. Like, just freaking get in, you know? And we'll just do 15 seconds today. That's all you got to do. Because the 15 seconds of the... And then you get out and you go on your day, teach your class, whatever. Of course, 15 seconds are over. And I'm like, oh, all right. You know, I could stay here. Two, three minutes go by. And I'm like, all right, this is getting boring. Like, don't I have stuff? I got to write a paper or something like yeah. that. Five minutes go by and I'm like, I'm getting back to my life. It's no big deal. I, I love I love that that story and I agree with you. I think I think there is the physical benefits and there are the mental benefits that are somewhere inter intertwined, but they also have their own journey that we can go through. And I think that was a very nice because we do need to wrap it up. We I oh my want, gosh, I'm a day. I we want, have a day, right? I, I think we should I think we should do a series of those because I believe in the in the effects of ice bath both both physically and mentally. I think it's something that we need to support each and every one of us in order to introduce it to uh, our society's uh, way of living living life. But I want it in chunks where people would 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 like to consume it. Again, we're going to have your your partner, the person who does the uh, the ritualistic aspect around it, Adrian, and uh, let's do that again in order to dive more into actual. Uh, maybe more pinpoint science 
obviously I'm addicted to your, uh, to your ice bath, which is called the Iron Forge. I'm sorry, Iron Forge is another device, which, which is called the Forge uh, by Morasco Forge. What, what I can uh, tell anyone who is looking to get an ice bath is that you, yours is not only uh, uniquely uh, designed and just an amazing device, is that it's the only device that I would really recommend uh, going through a life journey with uh, and and that and that we should all be um, exposed to to your device to to kind of measure the quality of something like an ice ice bath could be built as. Um, Tom, where can people, you know, find more about your company about you? Obviously, everything's going to be in the show notes. But uh, where where could anyone who wants more information go? You go to morozkoforge.com. And all of our articles are under the tab called journal. There's a tab called shop. You can put your credit card in and buy one. But here's how you can't find us. If you type in ice bath, we're uh -huh. like, you know, number 41 on Google or something. We don't advertise. We don't refactor, retarget, whatever. I don't know, like all the digital marketing things, we're doing them all wrong. So we're kind of hard to find. A lot of people don't even know how to spell Morozco. But it turns out that we're like number seven if you misspell Morozco in the, I mean, you will find us if you go for Morozco Forge Ice Bath. You don't have to spell it right. It'll get to us. You'll see all our competitors too, because they've been like stuffing Morozco into their HTML tags and stuff to try and rank on our, I'm a terrible salesman, Amate. Um, and I know you're going to have links on your website, but for those people in their car, what they got to remember is, Morozco Forge Ice Bath, and then we'll come up. That sounds great. And obviously, um, we are going to have links, so it would be easier for people to um, go to your website directly. I highly recommend also your Instagram page. I think it's extremely um, informative and uh, supportive as well if you're going through that cold exposure journey. Um, again, thank you. Uh, Tom Seeger, thank you very much. It was a absolute pleasure talking to you. And um, we, will, we will be talking again soon. So thank you very much. I'm going to say, I got to say one more other thing. You sold me that Young Goose stuff. I don't even remember what it is. I've, um, I'm at an age where I have age spots on my face. You asked me how I was doing, and I feel terrible if I don't tell you it's great. Thank you very I'm much. I'm really happy with the results. And I started getting them like... The first few days that I was using it, I don't always remember, but now I don't want to give it up. That's amazing. So, Tom, you, you, you've been amazing. Again, anyone listening to this podcast, please stay tuned. We're going to do a series of those. Um, and and yeah. um, thank you again, everyone.